Uh, members, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rebecca Miller. Uh, Rebecca is with Immigration New Zealand and she is responsible for people smuggling, human trafficking and regional cooperation on those aspects. Now you may ask, uh, people smuggling and hum human trafficking in New Zealand? Um, well, perhaps if we think of foreign fishing crews, sex workers, foreign restaurant workers that get brought in, well, maybe, maybe there is something going on. So we look forward to hearing Rebecca. She's responsible for leading and coordinating all aspects of people smuggling and human trafficking across the government uh, in New Zealand. And she's also the person uh, responsible for the Bali process on these aspects. Before joining Immigration New Zealand, she regularly worked for UN agencies and for three years was a consultant in the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. She studied criminology, sociology and education in her original home, Canada, and she has a PhD from the University of Auckland. So, please welcome Rebecca Miller. Thank you, John, for that introduction, and, and thanks to all of you for the, the invite today. It's a real honour for me to be here to, to talk to you about an issue that I am very passionate about. I'm going to date myself now, but I've worked um, on countering human trafficking, not facilitating human trafficking. <laughs> People look at my title and they get confused sometimes. It's like, are, are you actually facilitating it or are you working to, to combat it? Um, but it is an issue I've worked on for almost 19 years now and it is because I am so passionate and constantly learning uh, about the issue. There are an estimated 40.3 million people who were victims of modern slavery in 2016. And of those 40.3 million people, almost 25 million, were in forced labour. And these are people that were deceived or coerced to work under threat in industries such as uh, construction, fishing industry, service industry, horticulture, viticulture, um, and a number of agriculture industries. You can look at this number here, and if you look at the graph, this is from the Global Slavery Index that is produced by an NGO called Walk Free that's based in Australia. And over here we have almost two-thirds, over 30 million of those victims were in the Asia-Pacific region. And so that is our backyard. Those are the migrants who are coming to visit, to work, to study, to build relationships, to get married. So these are the people coming from our backyards. It is one of the world's largest criminal industries, earning exploiters $150 billion a year. It is just beh behind arms and drug trafficking. But with only 9,000 convictions in total globally last year, it remains a low-risk, high-profit crime with no signs of slowing down. And a lot of people find this hard to believe, but it is actually happening in New Zealand. I just thought I'd start briefly with just a couple of terms and definitions, because you often hear modern slavery, human trafficking, people smuggling, and they're often used interchangeably, but they do actually have different meanings and, and definitions. So modern slavery has become a term that's become quite popular recently. And one of the reasons for this is because when you talk about modern slavery, it sort of evokes an emotion. Compared to when you talk about smuggling or trafficking, you may not be entirely sure what that means, and particularly the media uses these terms interchangeably. So modern slavery really does give an image or a, an, an idea of what we might actually be talking about. It's not actually defined in international law. It's really an umbrella term for a range of um, um, horrible crimes such as human trafficking, slavery, child labor, forced labor, forced marriage, um, online sexual exploitation of children, and debt bondage. This is unlike human trafficking, which is actually defined um, through a UN convention and its supplementary protocol on trafficking. I won't go into the details around this, but 
human trafficking, you actually need three elements. You need some form of recruitment, transportation, movement, transfer, or harboring of a person through some form of deception or coercion for the purpose of exploiting that individual. When you have all of those three elements, you have human trafficking. Now this is actually different from people smuggling or human smuggling that you may um, hear about as well, even though the terms are used interchangeably. It is defined through a different UN protocol and it's really about facilitating the illegal entry of someone into a country for profit. So there are some key distinctions there. Number one, cross-border. Smuggling is always cross-border. So what you might be seeing in the Mediterranean um, or in the Mexican-US border, the majority of those cases are smuggling cases where someone is paying an individual to get them access to a particular country. This is different from human trafficking, which actually can be internally in a country. The movement aspect isn't that important. It's more about the exploitation and the coercion and deception of that person. A lot of people think, and I think again the media plays a, a role in this, is you know, there's a lot of images around people who are kidnapped, movies, if you've seen the movie Taken, where people are, are forced into these situations. That does happen sometimes, but the majority of human trafficking situations start with a migration process. It starts by the desire for a better opportunity, a better life. I came to New Zealand um, originally to study, got a job, citizenship. I had a really good migration experience, but unfortunately a lot of people who do come to New Zealand don't have that same experience and are exploited by recruiters, agents and employers. A question I get asked quite often is why don't they actually leave their situation, you know? Don't they have the ability to go? Well, unfortunately, a lot of people who do come here, it's that's when they've been deceived offshore, but then they're coerced and forced into staying into that situation. And often that can be quite subtle coercion. That could be potentially taking their passport off of them. They could, be sent, they could be told, well, look, you're in the country illegally because I actually didn't facilitate the right visa for you. So if you go to authorities, particularly immigration, you're just going to be deported or even put in jail because you've broken the law. There might be threats to the individual or to the individual's family. They might have a huge debt that they've paid back in their home country and they may own or owe 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars and they need to actually pay that back because to go back to their family that would be an enormous loss of face and shame but unfortunately they're never going to be able to pay that money back because the trafficker is always taking that extra bit off of them saying they need to pay for food or their accommodation etc so there's a range of reasons why a migrant might not be able to leave that situation. They may not speak the language. They may fear authorities. Many people come from countries where you can't trust the government or you can't trust law enforcement. Or they may not even know what their actual rights are. And the point is, is they also rarely see themselves as victims. So very quickly, I just wanted to touch upon um, a case that actually did occur in New Zealand. We've had two, six, we've had two prosecutions um, in New Zealand. The first one wasn't successful and it involved um, Indians who were trafficked to New Zealand. The second one, which I am going to talk about, was our first successful conviction and involved Fijians who were trafficked to New Zealand. We have a third case that's currently before the courts. This involves Bangladesh nationals who were trafficked to New Zealand and this is going to go to trial in February next year. But this particular trafficking case involved um, two offenders and uh, with offenders offshore as well. So there were two sisters based in Fiji and they put these actual advertisements, the, the front two there, the billboards and the, and the window, advertising opportunities to come to New Zealand. You'll make 16 to $18 an hour, you'll get a visa arranged for you, we'll sort out your flights, you'll have accommodation and food all taken care of for you and you'll be working to pick fruit or work in the construction industry. So a lot of the victims saw this advertisement. They had never been outside of Fiji before and they thought this was a fantastic opportunity to support their families. All they had to do was pay the agent, based in Fiji, $3,000 and everything would be taken care of. 
Now this was a lot of money to those individuals because they came from very subsistence living. As I said, they had never traveled before. So they borrowed from their friends and family and their villages for this opportunity. Most of them couldn't actually read or write um, or speak English. And what ended up um, the starting the process was a work visa was never going to be organized for them. They were actually just coming in on visitor visas. And once they did come into New Zealand, um, they were met by this individual who was actually um, our first trafficking conviction, Mr. Feroz Ali. He met them at the airport and one group actually stayed in Auckland and went to work in his jib fixing business. Um, he had a construction business up in Auckland. The other group went to another individual called Jafar Karusi. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough evidence to lay trafficking charges against him. We did lay Immigration Act charges, which he was found guilty of, but the other group went down to work in uh, the Bay of Plenty in the horticulture industry. So the migrants, um, the Fijians, the victims that went to Auckland basically lived in Ali's apartment. They slept on the floor when they had any kind of free time when they weren't working for him for little or no pay. They were doing household chores and anything else that Ali wanted them to do. The group that went down to the Bay of Plenty were actually in worse situations, which is a shame that we weren't able to lay trafficking charges. They were forced to sleep in a garage with no bedding, no mattresses, the only food they were given was a bag of chicken. Men and women who had never met before were forced to live in this garage without any heating together. There was no privacy where they could actually, you know, change their clothes or anything. What ended up happening was that um, the workers were obviously becoming quite distressed. They were working extremely long hours, 12 plus hours a day. Their movements were being controlled. They weren't really allowed to communicate back with their families. And one woman finally, she was getting more and more distraught and convinced Ali to let her go to church. Actually, it was Karusi. Let Karusi um, let her go to church. Um, she said, look, if I can go to church, I'll, I'll be much more efficient and, and I'll be a happier person. She went to church and one of the Good Samaritans there saw that she was quite distraught, took her out for a cup of coffee, learned about her experience and the fact that she had been working for months without any pay and were living in these horrible conditions notified her local MP who then notified immigration and this is how this case came to her attention. Feroz Ali was sentenced to nine years, six months um, in prison and was made to pay over $30,000 reparation to his victims. As I said, Karusi was unfortunately, we weren't able to lay um, human trafficking charges but we did get him on a range of Immigration Act charges and he was um, asked to pay over 55,000 US or uh, New Zealand dollars to his victims. All of that has been repaid um, by immigration to those individuals which gave them a a way to actually you know repay the individuals that they had um, borrowed the money from and also save some of that face and, and earn the good hard earned money that they deserved. Very quickly, because I was told I only had 15 minutes and I needed to stay quite quickly, what are we doing to address human trafficking in New Zealand? Um, we're actually doing quite a bit. Uh, I've been in this role for four years and I've worked internationally, advising different governments, working for the UN. So when I came into New Zealand, and if I'm completely honest, we were still, and we still are, trying to understand what the issue looks like in New Zealand. So a lot of the work I was doing was actually raising awareness, influencing um, my leaders and my colleagues um, within um, MB but also across government in terms of what human trafficking actually was. We developed um, and reinvigorated an interagency working group that um, involves all agencies who are uh, concerned about this issue because we really do have to work through a whole of government approach. We have a national plan of action against people trafficking which we're in the process of refreshing but a lot of agencies have very important roles to play. So for example, the victims that we support, we work very closely with the Ministry of Social Development. They help us provide uh, emergency accommodation for victims that we might identify, um, provide emergency grants because individuals who have been working for months on end without any pay, some of them only literally have the clothes on their back and no money in their pockets. 
We work to actually help them find employment if they're going to be staying in New Zealand, and of course we regularize their status because not one of the trafficking victims we've encountered have been on the proper visa. They've either been on work visas or those visas have expired that they came in on. We also work through a range of partners as well. Um, I was talking at lunch, I do a lot of work with the faith-based communities. There's a number of NGOs that are out there who are taking this issue very seriously and, and want to do good work. We also work very closely with the business sector because the business sector has a huge role to play in terms of making sure their supply chains are free from exploitation, trafficking and slavery. There's an act that's about to be passed in Australia which is going to have enormous implications potentially for businesses in New Zealand. So it's very important to be engaging the private sector in this space to make sure that um, we are all working towards the same goal. Question that always comes up, well if we're working with the private sector, what's the government doing? That also means looking at our own procurement and supply chains as well to make sure that they're free from exploitation and there's a bit of work that's happening under MB in that space. And then, of course, we work regionally and internationally. Um, John mentioned uh, the Bali process. Well, the Bali process is a forum of 45 countries that works to address human trafficking, people smuggling, and related transnational crime. New Zealand is a steering group member, so we're very active in that because we can get, essentially, we're a small country. We have to be quite um, conscious of how we engage, and we find engaging through a regional forum is, is much better. We get more bang for our buck, in a sense, um, than working bilaterally. But, of course, we do that as well. And of course, you know, we're very active on the international stage in terms of a number of global initiatives that are happening, the Global Compact, a number of UN um, resolutions that have come forward in this space. And there we are. Hopefully that was 15 minutes and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Excellent question, and, and the answer is yes. We actually have, um, that case is actually still open. Um, there's a number of elements. One is an, um, an assets of crime, proceeds of crime um, case that we have ongoing for both Ali and Karusi. We also are actually working really closely with the Fijian authorities as well to get the two sisters that I mentioned who had put the advertisements in um, and we're working from the Fijian side. We've been working really closely with the Fijian authorities and they've actually laid charges against those two sisters as well. So we are looking at all levers that we can to make sure that these individuals will never do this to another person again. And getting them where the money is, is key. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to ask, um, that second fellow who was a party to the trafficking, yeah. why couldn't you put him on trafficking? We just didn't have enough evidence. Um, unfortunately, there was um, a little less that we had with him, and it's a really high threshold to be able to lay human trafficking charges. So basically, it has to go from our investigation team to MB Legal to Crown Law and sign off by the Solicitor General. So the case really has to be airtight, and we were just missing a key piece with him, um, on, which was just unfortunate, because in a way, he was even worse than, than Ali in terms of the, the treatment of the victims. Well, certainly, the fines would suggest that he was more guilty. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, the sentence he got for the Immigration Act offences was home detention, which we were really disappointed in. But again, we're not finished with him. We're still, <laughs> we're still looking into him. <laughs> Thank you. Very interesting talk. Will Mr. Ali be deported when he finishes his sentence? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, under the Immigration Act, if a permanent resident commits a serious offense, they can be deported within 10 years of that permanent residency. Unfortunately, Ali was over that time, so we are bound by our legislation in terms of deportation. So, no, but he is still um, firmly ensconced in prison at the moment. And unlikely to get citizenship. Yes, yes, I highly doubt citizenship will be a, a top priority for him.
really enjoying your, your talk and particularly the questions that we've been, been able to answer. Could we go back to the victims and um, you touched towards the end of your talk about working with MSD to, yeah. to support them and so on. What's, what's typically happens with them? Do you deport them? Yeah. Um, because if you don't, won't New Zealand be seen as a soft touch? Excellent question, um, and this is one that, that comes up. Um, when we identify a suspected victim of trafficking, actually the worst thing we can do is deport them. That doesn't mean to say that you know countries don't make mistakes and, and that we haven't, if I'm honest, made mistakes in the past, most likely when we didn't know what trafficking was in New Zealand. When we identify a, a suspected case of trafficking, the first thing we do is to make sure that those victims are safe and we actually have had to get them out of um, critical situations at times. Um, other victims, some of the Fijian victims had already returned home, so this case came to us sort of after the fact. But the ones that we do identify victims in New Zealand, we immediately um, kind of go through a, a sort of, you know, we call it a victim-centered approach. What's in their best interest? And first it's just in a sense stabilizing them and getting them some basic resources that they need in terms of food and accommodation and, and a safe place to be, some money. We often work with um, community-based groups and ethnic groups to make sure we wrap sort of those services around them too, although that's a tricky one because New Zealand's a small space um, and often the offenders are from the same ethnic communities or um, backgrounds as the victims, so that's a tricky one. Um, and then it's about, well, what's in the best interests of those victims? Is it staying in New Zealand or is it actually returning home? And we've had different cases revealed or result in different situations. So um, the, we have a, another case which is very active and we haven't laid charges in, so I can't go into details. The Bangladesh victims, um, and that was sort of a mix in terms of who stayed and, and who returned home. Um, the Bangladesh victims, if this sort of stays internally, are very, you know, um, basically standing on their own two feet. Um, and we, but we did provide them with a lot of initial support. But again, for their sort of safety and, and privacy, I won't go into too many details. But it really is dependent on the individuals and what's in the best interest for them. And we will try and support that. And that might be facilitating their return back to their home country. Because a lot of victims do just want to return home. They want to be back with their families and the, and the support that they'll get there. One last question, Stuart. <laughs> I'm always reluctant to put statistics up, but I know people want statistics and they want to get a sense of the scope and scale of the problem. It's really difficult to estimate. Um, there are statistics around the fact that only 0.1% of victims are identified. So the, the extent of it in New Zealand is really difficult to, to say. The reason, one of the reasons why we haven't had so many prosecutions, one, they're incredibly complex cases, but two, is also about being able to identify those cases. So I would say, you know, if you, I've gone back into to some of the, the charges and, and sort of case history in New Zealand, and we have another provision called dealing in slaves, and I've read some of those um, case notes and basically they're trafficking. One was a Thai woman who was actually sold to an undercover police officer for the purposes of being exploited um, and forced to work as a prostitute. Trafficking. We didn't have trafficking legislation back then because that was in the 90s. Um, the Fijian girl, um, which was very much publicized in the newspaper where her mum sold her into prostitution and she was forced to, to work as a prostitute a number um, to serve a number of clients that could have been prosecuted as trafficking as well, but it's really about building that understanding, not just within law enforcement, but also with our, um, you know, our, our legal prosecutors and, and our judges as well. So we're getting there, and I think cases are going to increase, but um, it's, it's just a challenging crime to prosecute and identify. Level of how serious have those been? Are they 
So I think one of the points um, you should you should think about is that there's there's sort of a continuum of different forms of exploitation. So a lot of the cases you'll see in the media and that are brought by the labor inspector, for example, might involve minimum breaches of labor law. So you know people who might not be being paid holiday pay or might not have a proper contract or being passed. Um, paid less than minimum wage. A lot of the language schools and students have been sort of caught up in that in terms of exploitation. There's also an element of complicitness with um, those cases sometimes. The migrant fully knows that they're going to be paid, you know, $10 an hour, for example, or even we've had cases where they've fully paid their wage of a $50,000 or $60,000 a year job. They pay it to the employer. Um, because they're on a track for residency and they're willing to do that because of what they're going to get in the end. That's not trafficking. Trafficking needs those elements of coercion or deception and that real situation where the person is unable to leave that situation. They feel compelled to stay for a range of reasons. So there is a real continuum and there's a lot of different issues um, in New Zealand around exploitation, which is why the Minister of Immigration has said that this is a number one priority. He wants to understand what this actually looks like and, and understand the different situations and he's been working very closely um, with the education sector in that space because of the issues that have been, um, that have surfaced. John? Well, Rebecca, thank you very much for a, clearly a, an, an interesting talk. Um, I, I guess I hadn't realised, and maybe you hadn't, that um, the preponderance in the Asia-Pacific region, two-thirds of this is in sort of our broader neighbourhood. And the other thing I hadn't realised was that at $150 billion a year, it's right up there with... Uh, um, arms and drugs. So you can see the, the, the drivers for it. But I think your uh, uh, case, uh, New Zealand case, gave us all insights and that was really evidenced by the, the questions that you received and, and answered. So on behalf of the club, thank you very much. We have a small gift for you, an appreciation. <laughs> and members, please join me in thanking Rebecca. <laughs>